So the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about church words that we don't use either any other place or the same way other places. We're going to take a break from that today, but we'll come back to it next week. Somebody asked me again this week, where do the lessons that you read in church every Sunday, where do they come from? Now, what do you suppose? Does the pastor sit in his office on Monday morning and say, hmm, I wonder which texts I want to use this week? No. Nope. There's a list. It's called the lectionary. And most churches use one that goes for three years. And over the course of those three years, there's a first lesson, a second lesson, a gospel lesson, and a psalm for every week of the year, plus special ones for special days, like Christmas Day has its own lessons. And um, when we have a saint's remembrance, we have special lessons for that. But over the course of those three years, we cover most of the Bible. We're in year C now. That's the year for Luke's gospel. And so we're getting close to the end of year C. We've got just a few weeks left before, a couple months, I guess, before Advent starts. But in almost all the Lutheran churches, they're going to hear the same lessons. And in the Methodist churches and the Presbyterian churches and the Episcopalian churches and even in the Catholic church, although sometimes theirs are off by a week or two from ours. Now, it might seem kind of stifling. You have to use the lesson for that week. But there's a good reason for it. Because if I had to sit in my office on Monday morning and come up with the lessons, I would pick what I want to talk about. But this way, we have to hear what God wants us to hear about. Pastor doesn't get to skip those lessons like the last two weeks that I would just as soon leave alone. But over the course of Three years, we hear the whole of the Bible. Not every passage and not every story, but we get everything from Genesis clear through Revelation. And we hear what it is God wants us to hear, not just what Pastor Ed wants us to hear. Pretty cool? You'll find out why I changed it to that in a minute. <laughs> Amen.
First reading today is from the book of Habakkuk, chapters 1, verses 1 through 4, and chapters 2, verses 1 through 4. Injustice and violence in the time leading up to the Babylonian exile moves this prophet to lament. How can a good and all-powerful God see evil in the world and seemingly remain indifferent? God answers by proclaiming that the righteous will live by faith. The reading begins. The oracle that the prophet Habakkuk saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not listen, or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law becomes slack, and justice never prevails. The wicked surrounds the righteous. Therefore, judgment comes forth perverted. I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what he will say to me and what he will answer concerning my complaint. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so that a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them, but the righteous live by their faith. The word of the Lord. The psalm today is Psalm 37, verses 1 through 9, which we will read responsively. Do not be provoked by evildoers. Do not be jealous of those who do wrong. For they shall no soon rather like grass, like the green grass fade away. Put your trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and find safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, who shall give your heart's desire. Commit your way to the Lord. Put your trust in the Lord and see what God will do. The Lord will make your vindication as clear as the light, and the justice of your case and the new day sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently. Do not be provoked by the one who prospers, the one who succeeds in evil schemes. Refrain from anger. Leave rage alone. Do not be provoked. It leads only to evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who hope in the Lord shall possess the land. The second reading today is from uh, the second book of Timoth Timothy, chapters 
1, verses 1 through 14. This letter written to Timothy is a personal message of encouragement. In the face of hardship and persecution, Timothy is reminded that his faith is a gift of God. He is encouraged to ex exercise that faith with the help of the Holy Spirit. The reading begins. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, for the sake of the promise of life that is in Christ, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I am grateful to God, whom I worship with a clear conscience, as my ancestors did, when I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and love and of self-discipline. Do not be ashamed, then, of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher, and for this reason I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know the one in whom I have put my trust, and I am sure that he is able to guard until that day what I have entrusted to him. Hold to this standard of sound teaching that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard the good treasure entrusted to you with the help of the Holy, living Sp Holy Spirit living in us. The Word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 17th chapter. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus instructs his followers about the power of faith and the duties of discipleship. He calls his disciples to adopt the attitude of servants whose actions are responses to their identity rather than works seeking reward. The lesson begins. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. The Lord replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your slave, who has just come in from plowing or tending the sheep in the field, come here at once and take your place at the table? Would you not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink? Later you may eat and drink. Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. The Gospel of the Lord. We have the year broke or the Bible broken up into three years. We call that the lectionary. And so each Sunday we have a portion of the Bible that's prescribed for us to read. Now you can't read everything or we would be here all day. So they have to pick and choose what's going to go in that week's lesson. 
sometimes they don't put in enough. Which is all prelude to say, I'm going to read you what came before today's lesson. Jesus said to his disciples, occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to anyone by whom they come. It would be better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea than for you to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If another disciple sins, you must re rebuke the offender. And if there is repentance, you must forgive. And if the same person sins against you seven times a day, and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. We've all heard Mark's version of this story. If we had faith the size of a mustard seed, we could move the mountains. And indeed, we hear this lesson as well. And if we just start with increase our faith, there's all kinds of things that we could talk about that having just a little bit of faith would make a big deal for. If we had just a little more faith, we could feed the world. And if we had just a little more faith, there might be more peace. But in Luke's version, it is not just not about any kind of faith. It is about this. Jesus tells the disciples, if your brother or sister sins against you seven times a day and asks you to forgive them, you must forgive. And the disciples, the apostles, they say, Oh, Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith, O oh Lord. Oh, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could pull up a mulberry tree and cast it into the ocean. Now, apparently, a mulberry tree is a really apt metaphor for this because apparently mulberry trees have just a forest of roots down there. And that more than maybe any other, well, who knows? They're really hard to pull up. And what a great description for what it's like to forgive. It's like pulling up that weed that just does not want to let go. It's like pulling up that bush that's roots seem to go clear to China. It's like pulling up a mulberry bush and casting it into the sea with faith. With faith the size of a mustard seed, Jesus says, we can move mountains with faith the size of a mustard seed. We, we can move our hearts. I realized as I was working on this, I've already told part of this story, but it's good, so I'm doing it again. Way back in 1981, a fella decided that he was going to assassinate Pope John Paul II. He failed. And he was captured and arrested and convicted and thrown into prison. And Pope John Paul asked people to pray for his attempted assassin. And he said, I have sincerely forgiven him. Oh, boy, what an outcry. Not that somebody, not just that somebody tried to assassinate the Pope, but he didn't really forgive him. 
He's just doing that for a show. He's not really forgiving him. John Paul was adamant, though, that he had, that he had indeed forgiven him, so he went and met him. And he lobbied to get the man better treatment and that he would have as easy a life as was possible. And he stayed in communication with him for many years after that. And when he was asked about it later, how could you really forgive somebody who tried to kill you? He said, well, Jesus forgave those who crucified him. And Jesus has forgiven me all of my sins. What was left for him to do? But for him to do as he was supposed to, to do as he ought to, to forgive this man who had harmed him. Increase our faith, O Lord. Give us the faith to pull up the hate and the resentment, the anger that divides us, and to cast them away. Give us the faith to trust that we are safe in God's care and that we can forgive our brothers and sisters seven times a day or 77 times. Give us the faith to trust that forgiveness truly has the power to give life and to change the world. Give us a mustard seed's worth of faith, O oh Lord, so that we can, so we can do this thing that we ought, so that we can forgive one another, even and especially when it's hard, when we've been hurt, even and especially when we don't really want to, John Paul's forgiveness had a huge impact on Mr. Abka's life. In later interviews, he would say that he was completely changed, that this man that he had so hated that he wanted to kill him would come and be kind to him, that it had given him a faith and a hope that he had never had before. And I have to wonder, what kinds of ripples that forgiveness sent out into the world, how that changed the lives of his friends and his family and his community. How far did that forgiveness reach out into the world? Increase, increase our faith, O oh Lord. In these days when our world is at one another's throats and anger and hatred are so tearing us apart. The command to forgive one another seems like moving mountains or ripping up mulberry trees. But oh, how our world needs it. Our neighbors, our family, our friends, and we ourselves. Forgiveness is indeed an act of faith. To truly forgive is to trust that God is in control and that God, that God will make everything okay in the end. To truly forgive is to see beyond ourselves and our own hurts and needs and to see the people that God sees, the people that God loves, the people that God forgives. To truly forgive is to recognize our own faults and failings, our own sins that need to be forgiven, our own broken relationship with those around us and with our God. To truly forgive, it is an act of faith. And sometimes, sometimes when the forgiving is hard, when we've been hurt so deeply, sometimes our forgiving is just that, an act of faith that God will forgive when we are not yet quite ready or able. 
One of my friends was discussing today's lesson. In her neighbor, in her neighborhood, they got a new mail carrier one day. And now that doesn't seem like anything terribly noteworthy. Mail carriers come and go. But this new mail carrier was black. Well, in this day and age, who would care? One of her neighbors cared. The very next day, there were racist signs all over the yard. Now, as you can imagine, in this suburban neighborhood where everyone likes things to look perfect and peaceful, the phones lit up. What are we going to do about our neighbor with all of those hateful signs? Should we confront them? Should we put up our own signs in our own yards? I find it interesting that it wasn't till later that anyone thought to ask the mail carrier. But on a hot summer's day, Amazon solved the problem for them. There was a package for that address from Amazon. It was a big package and it had to be signed for. The mail carrier wondered what he should do. Should I just refuse to deliver it? Should I leave it out at the, at the street and just expect them to come find it? Maybe I should have someone else do it. Showing faith and a wisdom that most of the neighbors weren't quite prepared for, he took the package to the door. He wondered what kinds of things had caused this person to put out such hateful and terrible signs in their yard just because he was delivering their mail. And he wondered what kind of reception he would get at the door. Now, I'm guessing that he was hoping that he would ring the bell and no one would answer and he could just put that sticker on the door says, I tried to deliver it. But that's not what happened. He rang the doorbell and the curtains moved over just a little bit. And a voice, a small elderly female voice spoke through the door. What do you want? I have a package for you and it needs to be signed for. The door opened just far enough for the chain And as he handed in the form, he couldn't help himself. He asked the little woman behind the door, are you okay? I couldn't help but notice the signs and figure that they were for me. Is there something I can do for you? There was grumbles and the form was shoved back out the door and it was shut in his face and he went not knowing just what had happened. But overnight, the signs disappeared. The neighbors wondered what had happened and finally they asked him and he said, I forgave. And apparently she forgave me too. Increase our faith, O oh Lord. Increase our faith that we might learn to forgive one another. Increase our faith even to the size of a mustard seed so that the power of your love and your grace, the power of forgiveness, might, might come over our world. Amen. Amen.